started. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is the first ever of my career story series that Dan, Jasmine, and myself at Harvard Workforce are working to put on. Um, so the point of this is every month, about the fourth Wednesday of each month, uh, we want to invite someone in the community to come and share their career story, um, any barriers, and the questions, network, and kind of discuss what it's been like along the way. Um, and so whether that be in the field of law, entrepreneurship, um, real estate, nonprofits, uh, we hope to you know, get a variety of people in the community and career fields. So this one um, is a focus on law. And I first heard um, Sean Paul speak back in February of this year at the Women's Conference. And as she was talking, it truly made me think like, I want to go into law. Everything she's saying is so inspiring and <laughs> and it was wonderful. And so I really wanted to um, make it a point to get her career and to share her story with you all. Um, so I'm going to share a brief bio of her and then we'll get it going. Chantal Ann Mallory is a native of Omaha, Nebraska, and was educated at Creighton University, Creighton University School of Law, where she received her Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies and her Juris Doctorate. A licensed attorney, over the course of her 15-year practice, she has specialized in adoption, juvenile, family, and employment law, while serving in nonprofit executive positions. She currently serves as Executive Director of the Nebraska Legal Diversity Council, a newly formed nonprofit organization aiming to increase and support diversity in the practice of law and law school matriculation in Nebraska. Chantal also serves as an adjunct law professor at Creighton Law School, teaching a race and law course she developed. A featured speaker, trainer, coach, and consultant on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, access, justice, and belonging. Chantal is certified in nonprofit executive leadership and leading equity and inclusion in organizations through Northwestern University. She is an active community volunteer and board member, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and attend Salem Baptist Church. However, her favorite role is mom to her two sons. Uh, and, you know, Stan and I were talking yesterday about how maybe it would be cool to like play a walk-in song for our speakers. And so I emailed Chantal and I was like, do you have a preference? Um, and she wrote back, you know, wow, interesting question. I've never had that asked before, but let's have it be something women affirming and powerful. And so my instant thought was Lizzo. Um, but I heard this song on the radio this morning. And I thought, what a perfect song. So without further ado, follow on our radio. Good song. So I think I'm going to incorporate that into teaching law school. Like every week, I'm going to walk out to the song, and my students are going to be like, "What?" <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm truly excited and also honored. Um, let me know if at any time you can't hear me. I've never, ever in life had a problem with projecting, but it's kind of um, high ceiling, so sometimes that echoes, or if you can't see me with the pole, but I'll try to move around a little bit. Um, so, you know, I'm always thinking about when I'm asked to speak somewhere, like, what aspects of your story do you share with people? Um, what things do you keep for yourself? What things are helpful? What people don't want to just hear you just, you know, go on and on about your life. What, what can you say that will hopefully help to inspire someone else. And so I'll try to share those things with you all today that I, I feel could provide some inspiration. Um, I know that we're probably in a bunch of different careers and different stages and um, not everybody necessarily wants to go into law, but I feel like the aspects of my story that I'll share with you today can be um, kind of universally applied to whatever you're doing. Um, so I started out here in Omaha, and I'm still here, born and raised, um, not too far from where we are now. So I grew up um, about half of my childhood on 35th and Blondo, um, so a couple blocks to the west of here. And um, I had an amazing childhood. I didn't realize we were poor. 
And so I got a little older and I was like, you know, we, I wore a lot of clothes that other people had worn before and <laughs> things like that. And so um, when you grow up um, in a, a, a happy, healthy, I guess, household, um, I think sometimes you don't realize what you don't have. You just kind of grow up surrounded by love and I had a huge family. My mom is one of 16 kids. Um, so kind of a really strange anomaly for a black family in Nebraska. They've been in the newspaper and all kinds of stuff when they were younger for having so many kids. And um, my dad comes from a, a slightly smaller family and he's from Chicago. And my mom's uh, family was Air Force. So they're from all over the place. They've had kids in Newfoundland and San Antonio on every Air Force base, I believe in the United States. So um, two very different families but raised in a predominantly Black family. And um, I always had this kind of dualistic upbringing, and now I have this kind of dualistic career. And so I think that's just something that I'm starting to process as a woman and embrace about myself is that I'm very much uh, equal parts creative and analytical. I'm very much nonprofit, but I also have kind of a corporate side and then we throw some of the education pieces in there and I think all of it is a product of kind of this dualistic way that I was raised so I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood not too far from here and I attended school during the day at St. Cecilia's Cathedral um, Elementary School um, K through 8 there same people pretty much my whole entire childhood and all of those people save a few were, were white um, so I was in this completely white environment during the day, this completely black environment uh, when I was home. And sometimes it made for some kind of strange issues. I can remember going to what used to be called Girls Club because I'm that old, um, that is now called Girls Inc. And people teasing me saying, why do you wear the same clothes every day? And I'm like, it's a uniform, stupid. Like, I have to wear it to school. But people didn't really have that experience as much as I did in the neighborhood that I grew up in and with some of the circles that I ran in. And so when they finally figured out what it was, um, then people kind of laid off that. And then it was, well, you talk like a white girl. Why do you talk like that? Um, and so I kind of had this dichotomy, and this was probably my introduction, I think, to racial identity, racial issues. Didn't have names for that at that time, um, and it's probably a good reason why I'm interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, um, and just kind of the identities that we all form that make us show up as our authentic selves, and so I did a lot of code switching when I was young, and I would flip in and out of, I, I have to make sure I act Black here because this is whatever acting Black is, um, because that's how we accept it, and then when I come here, can't act too Black here because this is the way that I'm accepted. And I think that while that sounds like it's a lot for a child to navigate, it also gave me some exceptional skills uh, that I try to, I always try to make sure that I bring out the positive new things. And I think it allowed me to be able to really connect with folks in every room that I'm in. And that's a skill that some folks don't have. And so I'm grateful for the way that I was uh, brought up. And so when I was growing up, I was always told, you're going to go to college. And I would tell people all the time, I'm going to college. I had no idea where college was, well, how you got there or what you did when you got there, but it sounded like that's what everybody thought that I was supposed to do. And so um, that's what I was supposed to do. And um, as I got older, I wanted to find out a little bit more about like, what does college mean? How do I get there? My mom has these books for us, myself and my two brothers, and in the books, um, it has like those little composite photos of us when we were growing up. And it has some of our little awards and papers and things like that. And it also has a space for us to write what we wanted to be when we grew up. And uh, mine changed a little bit here and there. Um, but that was always something within my household that was a conversation. What do you want to be? Um, and also being affirmed and told as a, a woman that I could be anything that I wanted to be. And so I went through these phases where I wanted to be a doctor, and then I thought I wanted to be a detective, <laughs> and I thought I wanted to be an attorney at some point, and a teacher. Consistently, I always wanted to be a mom, and I'm glad that I, I got the opportunity to uh, be a mom to two wonderful boys. And so growing up, my mother was a teen mother. 
she had me when she was 18. And at that time, they didn't really allow young women to be at school pregnant. There was a lot of shame that was packed in around what she did. And I think some of that shame always got transferred to me and kind of um, more in a protective way. People used to always tell me, don't get pregnant when you're a teenager. You need to go to college. You need to do this. You're smart. And so that was always kind of a fear of mine in the back of my mind was I really want to stay focused and accomplish these things and make everyone proud. And my mother sacrificed a great deal of her time being a teen mom and not really going to be able to do what she wanted to do. And my father as well. Both of them are absolutely intelligent enough to have graduated from college, but neither one of them did because they had to work to take care of us. And so I'm incredibly grateful for my parents and I always shout them out. Um, my father is a retired city bus driver. Um, so I thank him for me not being directionally challenged because I would ride the bus with him a lot and I would people watch and he would teach me how to navigate the city. And so I'm pretty good at it actually. And then my mother um, always worked within the hospital system in some way, shape or form, usually administrative support. And I'm grateful to her as well, because I know that she sacrificed a lot as a woman to make sure that uh, my needs were met and my brother's needs were met. And we're all highly successful because of her. And at this stage in my, my life, I'm a 47 year old woman. My mom is in her sixties and I'm starting to see her more as a woman than as my mother. And so it's a, a really interesting journey that I'm on right now because I want my kids to see me in all of my authenticity and my complexity as well. And so we're kind of on that journey where I'm really learning her again and appreciating her for all the sacrifices that she made so I could be successful. Um, so I grew up in Catholic school. And then when I was about 11, my whole entire world changed. My parents split up and for about two years, we did this dance while they uh, decided to get divorced. And then my mom got custody of us. And she decided I'm not doing the Catholic school thing anymore. She wasn't Catholic. My dad was. And she was like, you all are going to public school. And I did about a year and a half at Monroe Middle School. And I don't know, a show of hands, has anybody ever seen the, the movie Lean on Me? That's how it felt. Like <laughs> going from Catholic school to abruptly being dropped off at a public school, I felt like I was going to lose my life or something. Like it was just the weirdest thing ever. And um, it was completely different than the environment that I had been brought up in, not to mention that I lost all of the people who were my close friends for my entire life, but I adop adapted pretty quickly. Um, I made friends there and I went on to go to public high school as well. Um, and so I went to Burke High School and did pretty well there as well and decided that I was going to be a doctor. Thought I was going to be a doctor, thought I was going to be a pediatrician, obstetrician, knew that I loved children. And this is what I want to do with my life. And then I got through my freshman year and I was like, Whew, okay, so maybe not. Uh, I started taking these science classes and I was like, I really don't enjoy this. Um, and I probably could have toughed it out and then maybe would have gotten to the enjoyable part, but I didn't. And um, I changed my major and I started thinking about what do I really like that comes kind of naturally to me? And it was talking, it was communicating, it was definitely arguing and persuading um, and all those things. And so I decided that I was gonna be a communication studies major with a Spanish minor. And one day I was walking around campus and the lawyer thing was kind of in my mind a little bit. And I saw a flyer for the pre-law club and mock trial team. So I was like, hmm, I didn't know we had one of those here at Creighton. Let me go to this meeting and see what that's about. So I walk into the meeting and of course, I'm the only black face in the room again, which is kind of a theme of my entire experience is like being the first or the only to navigate spaces. So it was that way at St. Cecilia's. It was that way at Burke. It was that way at Creighton. And so I walked in and I made friends pretty easily because I had that skill set where I'm able to connect with a lot of different people of different backgrounds. And um, I joined the team. And that first year, they had a bunch of upperclassmen who were in the attorney positions. They were like, come in, learn the ropes, be a witness, because you had to act out the entire case, witnesses and everything. So I was a doctor as a, a witness, because I, I, evidently I can play one on TV, but I couldn't study enough to, to get it done. So um, I do that and I'm like, I love this. This is amazing. Those folks are graduating and I'm like, I'm going to do the attorney thing. 
uh, next time. And so I decide that next time I'm gonna go out for an attorney role, I get it. And we start doing competitions and I'm killing it. So I'm like, this is it. Like you have that kind of moment where you're like, you hear the music, the ah, and you're like, this is what I wanna be. And I'm doing the attorney uh, piece and I'm starting to win like these regional awards and things like that. And I become president of the pre-law club. The only black person that was involved with this, the first one to do that. And I kind of find what I'm connected with. And I start to apply for law schools and I get accepted into five law schools, but Creighton gives me the most academic scholarships to go. And um, so that's what I do. So I stay at Creighton for another three years and I get married. I'm expecting my child. I'm huge and pregnant when I'm walking across the stage to get my doctorate in law. And I have my son, he's due the week that the bar exam is, is supposed to happen. And so I was like, I'm not gonna pay that money and go into labor and not be able to take this exam. And so I put it off and I'm like, I'll be a mom for a year. I've been going straight through like kindergarten to a doctorate degree, no breaks. I'm gonna take a break, I'm gonna be a mom. I was working in education. Um, I worked with students again, <laughs> this love for kids always comes up somehow in my story. And I'm working through OPS with kids who are in an alternative middle school who have been displaced. Um, they don't have that anymore. I didn't even know at that time that they had alternative schools for middle schoolers. I thought that was only like at the high school level. And so I did that for um, actually what ended up being about five years. And my mom and my dad were like, hey, planning on taking that bar exam anytime soon? You're gonna do anything with that degree? And um, so I said, okay, I will. And I finally sat for the bar exam and became a practicing attorney in 2006. And so fast forward to now, about 16 years later, uh, my primary practice area has always been employment law as well as family and juvenile law. I served for about 16 years up in Douglas County Juvenile Court as a guardian at litem, which in this state is an attorney who is assigned to represent the needs of children who are going through uh, abuse and neglect proceedings due to the actions of their parents. And so I've ever had everything from you know, cases where I've had children placed out of the home because the house was in filthy conditions. If you've ever seen an episode of Hoarders, I've actually been in those types of houses. My least favorite case to have, my mentee just walked in and she knows my neat freakness. So she knows that those were the things that gave me uh, the absolute shudders. And it was always, well, we'll return the kids to the home as long as it's subject to the approval of the guardian at Lydum, which meant I had to go out to the home and see what it looked like. So um, probably my least favorite part of that practice, but it also was very fulfilling to me because I was kind of the gatekeeper for safety for young people. And that was something that means a, an incredible amount to me now and did as I was practicing. And I had everything else, drug cases, sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, you name it. Um, at one time at my busiest, I had over 100 cases at a time, which isn't 100 children that I'm representing because I would have sibling strips sometimes of four, three, four, five, six kids that were removed from the home. So an incredible amount of work. And guardians at Lydum in Nebraska are required to see those youth once every six months in person. I have to go to the house that they live in. I need to talk to them in private, make sure that they're being taken care of, make sure that they have all of their needs being met and those sorts of things. So very, very case intensive. And for a while I was up in juvenile court and some of my mentors were like, well, we don't want you to get pigeonholed. You're really smart. And I think you could do well at a firm environment. We don't want you to just be stuck being uh, an attorney for a youth. So let's start applying to some firms. And I ended up um, working at a firm. It was about two and a half years. I integrated the firm. Once again, first only black woman in a space very few women in that firm that weren't in like administrative or secretarial positions as well. And you could tell by the culture of that organization. And so being there about two and a half, three years felt like 10 years. And I finally said, I can't do this anymore. I'm working 70, 80 hours a week. I have two kids now. 
and one is getting ready to go to kindergarten and I don't feel like I'm being the mom that I should be working 70, 80 hours and worried about billable hours and things like that. Plus, I was representing people who were getting a divorce a lot, who can be some of the most miserable, <laughs> annoying people ever. It's like, um, no, you don't need to call me because he returned her in a yellow shirt instead of a green shirt. Like, let's, let's just wait and talk about this later. So I did that for a while. And I really, really miss juvenile court. When I was working at the law firm environment, I didn't feel like I was helping people or giving back. And so throughout the course of my career, I've done some other positions as well. Um, and I tell people all the time that sometimes you, you get put into a position so that you can find out what you don't like or what you shouldn't be doing just as much as what you should be doing. And so I'm thankful for those, those experiences because they've taught me things about myself. And so I know about myself that I have to feel like I'm giving back. Um, in order to, to work at a place and feel like I have some sense of fulfillment. And so I decided I was going to go back to juvenile court, but I was only going to go back part-time. There was another opportunity that I wanted to take in the Women's Center for Advancement. If you're not familiar with their work here in Omaha, they used to be the YWCA. They do a lot of domestic violence work, helping women to rebuild their lives um, when they're coming out of abusive situations, drug use, a, a number of things. And so I became a program manager there and developed a mentoring program for kids that were um, like the children of some of these women, as well as coach some of these women on how to get their lives back on track. Um, some of them were system involved through juvenile court. So my expertise in that area helped because a lot of people who go into courtroom situations are so uneasy because they don't understand how to navigate this, that system at all. And so I was able to do that for a couple of years, and then I got a call for a progressively higher position and went to be an executive director for Boys and Girls Clubs of the Midlands. Again, kids, 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 right? And so I did that, still practicing law in juvenile court, because this for me is like purpose and passion working. It's really hard to let those children go um, and turn them over to another attorney. Plus, if you've ever, has anybody ever worked in juvenile court at all? Okay. So you might know this from your experience, what I'm about to say, but the turnover in juvenile court is incredible. So kids are getting new case managers all the time, new county attorneys in and out because they move up and they do things. And so you have this revolving system of people in these young people's lives in what is the most traumatic thing that probably happens to them in their whole entire life. So as their attorney, I would like to be that stable person who guides them through that system until they're reunified. So I have this caseload going, but I'm also an executive director. And after doing that for a few years, I get another call about leading a division of another nonprofit that does refugee resettlement and immigration services. And I'm like, I don't know anything about that, but I do know about vulnerable populations and those are transferable skills. Those are also transferable by the way that we can help and assist. And it just intrigued me. I, I wanted to learn about a new area of what was going on in this community. And so I accepted the role. Um, and while I was there, that's when I got involved with Northwestern. And I started to really formalize my education around nonprofit executive leadership. And I was in a wonderful cohort and got certified through Northwestern. And it was just an amazing opportunity to really examine who I am as a leader. And that opened up other groups. And so I started to segue, when I was at this nonprofit, you kind of had to do everything if you led a division. So you did your own hiring, you did your own screening, you tried to retain people, we did our performance evaluations, the whole nine. I had 82 people who reported to me in offices in four cities, Omaha, Lincoln, Lexington, and Grand Island. And I, when I left there, I had 190 unused vacation hours that they had to cash me out on because that's how much I worked. And I said, I can't keep up this pace. I might as well have gone back to the law firm. And so um, another position became available and I was looking to maybe start to segue more into employment law because I had done some of that at the law firm and really enjoyed that and HR. And I went to Omaha Home for Boys and I started out there as their talent development leader. 
And by the time I left there, I was their chief professional development officer and also general counsel. And so you'll notice that at the beginning of when I was hired, it was more talent development, nonprofit executive leadership, HR. And by the end, I had negotiated to add general counsel to my title and my compensation because I was doing a lot of legal work for them and it was like they were getting two positions in one. And so I, I made the decision that at my next performance review, I was going to pitch the addition to my title because I don't like to work for free. I know none of you do. I do at times do things pro bono, but I'd like to do that when I wanna do it and not um, just having services out there that I'm not one, being compensated for, and two, that I don't have the title for. Um, and so I negotiated that, they agreed. Um, I pitched it in a way where I, I contacted our accounting person. I said, can you tell me how much we paid for outside legal counsel over the last 10 years um, each year? And so she gave me that. And I came in like two years before that and it dropped significantly because I was doing things for them. Um, and so I pitched that, it was successful, and that's what I became. And I was at that organization for about four and a half years, um, part of which was during the pandemic. The pandemic hit, and we had to scramble and figure out how do you do, um, if you're not familiar with Omaha Home for Boys, it is like out-of-home placement care, wraparound services for youth and young adults who are system involved or formerly system involved. So how do you do that? And you have a pandemic going on. You have kids that are coming in and out, going home. You have staff who have to be in close quarters and living quarters with young people. And so we navigated the pandemic for about a year and a half. And progressively during that time, I, I feel like we had two pandemics going on, right? We had this, this health and public health crisis going on. And we also had this social justice and racial equity uh, pandemic or crisis going on. And during the course of that, I started to formalize my education once again at Northwestern and become certified in leading equity and inclusion in organizations. And that led me to start doing some consulting, coaching and things on my own and kind of develop a business lane for myself on, on my own. Lots of speaking engagements and things like that. And um, a partner and I, who also is in HR that I met at, um, a nonprofit. She does a lot of work in that area. We decided we were going to combine and we were really going to push an agenda of forwarding what is one of our purpose and passion areas, which is teaching organizations and individuals within organizations how to hire, recruit, retain, and navigate a culture that is much more equitable and inclusive. And so I've been doing that work for the last three years, I think. Sometimes I miss a year because of the pandemic. Like we all do, I'm like, wait, that was last year. And people are like, no, that's two years ago. Um, and it's opened just incredible opportunities for me. I work with a consulting firm um, that is in Chicago and I do some work for them remotely from here. Um, I've gone back and taught at Northwestern now instead of being just the student. And um, I have clients all over the country and that opened up the door for another opportunity, which is my current position. So I now serve as executive director uh, at a newly formed nonprofit called the Nebraska Legal Diversity Council. And the Nebraska Legal Diversity Council was formed in order to really coordinate collaborative impact efforts by a bunch of different stakeholders in the legal community to make our profession more diverse. So that there's representation in the court systems and in legal offices, and then also in uh, the legal departments within corporations. And so we're focused in four areas, main areas of work. We really wanna expand the pipeline and especially at an earlier age. So giving young people as well as some adults a taste of what it's like to be an attorney, be a judge, um, letting them see that representation and see people who look like them so they know that this is something that they can be. But doing that at a much younger age. Mainly people started talking to people about law school and things like that when they were in college, right? So where do you want to go? Do you want to do grad school? Do you think you want to be a lawyer? This is how you get to that path. We want to back that up and start doing that in grade school. And more than just the little 
field trip that you get down to the courthouse with some actual interaction with attorneys. And then we're also working on uh, law school matriculation and graduation rates. We want more diverse populations to come here. We are comprehensive. Um, so we want them to go to Creighton or UNL. We just want them to be in Nebraska and they can fit into any category that is underrepresented currently in law school. So gender, LGBTQIA plus uh, status, race and ethnicity, um, national origin, any of those things, ability, um, veteran status, which presents challenges because I'm an organization of one. So right now we have some capacity limitations, but I have an amazing board. We have 19 folks that are on board, the two law schools, the Bar Association, and then we have 13 law firms and three corporate partners right now. And they pledged over half a million dollars to fund that work for the first three years so that we didn't really have to worry about the fundraising aspect of it. And so currently we're doing all that. Our logo has been developed. I'm so excited about that. And um, we're working on a mentoring program that will match up law students with attorneys. We're also working on a toolkit for our employer partners that will teach them more mindful and modern practices within our specific uh, profession on how to recruit and retain uh, more diverse folks um, within their organizations. So that's a little bit about what I'm doing now, as well as I'm trying to still raise a 22 year old <laughs> who's out on his own and I'm feeling my first little uh, flurries of emotion from having a halfway empty nest. And then I have a, a 16 year old who attends Burke High School um, right now that I'm trying to raise as well. So mama has about two more years and I don't know if I'll be in Nebraska after that or if I'm gonna try to take my show on the road somewhere else, but um, Nebraska will always be home, specifically Omaha will always be home. And even more specific to that, North Omaha will always be who I am. Um, regardless of where I live, this community is incredibly important to me. And so I try to go out and talk to as many little black girls as I can, or any girls, black girls, brown girls, anybody, to let them know that, and I will follow up with this conversation if you are interested in going to law school, <laughs> because we need um, people, I've been in courtrooms where I've physically seen people's shoulders drop when they walk in and see that I'm in there and I have uh, an identity that represents them, a lived experience that they can relate to and they know I can relate to them. I understand our family structures. I understand what we do and how we do it. And other people don't necessarily have that cultural competency around that. So it makes people a little bit more comfortable as they're navigating some of the most incredibly difficult times in their lives. And so that's what I do. Um, I am trying very hard, um, as you can imagine with work and the lack of attorneys of color here, specifically black women attorneys. I always say we're the unicorns of the profession. Less than 2% of attorneys in this country are black women. Um, and so I try to do a lot of mentoring, a lot of speaking to groups, but I also am trying very hard in my board service to make sure that I'm as impactful as possible and that I am aligned with what I feel like I was placed on this earth to do. Um, which is to try to push those conversations in more collaborative ways and bring us together in ways where we can really thrive and respect the differences between us and see that as a thing that is positive and not negative, as well as continue to train up the next generation of folks who are, are coming into to my profession. And so that's been in a dualistic way. It's been law, it's been teaching, it's been... Uh, nonprofit. It's been a lot of different things. I um, also currently teach a course at Creighton Law School called Race and Law that I developed shortly after the George Floyd murder um, by request of the law school. And um, it has been, wow, just an amazing journey to teach young minds. Um, and some of which aren't very young. I've had 40 and 50 year old people in my class. Sometimes people go to law school as a second career. But one of the most frequent pieces of feedback that I get is, why didn't we learn any of this any sooner? Um, we start talking about the intersection between racism and law. And I start from colonialism and bring it to present day, which is a ton of material to cover in one semester. 
um, and a lot of people who are in a terminal degree program, meaning a finite final degree, your doctorate, have never learned these things about our country. And so if I can bring awareness in my little group of 15 to 20 students a year and train them to be better, more ethical attorneys who look at things through a DEI lens, then I feel like I'm aligned and I'm doing my part. So that is my journey. That's how I got to where I am now as a practicing attorney, as a nonprofit executive, and as a professor. And uh, I'm honored to be able to share my story with you, the twists and turns and everything else with it. Um, but I do wanna save time as well, pretty good on time actually, um, for us to, to have just a dialogue and maybe for me to answer a few questions. I also wanna, before I do that, just um, shout out my mentee who took time from her lunch break to come and sit with me. Dominique is a new attorney. <laughs> She graduated from Drake uh, Law School and she passed the Iowa Bar exam. And um, she's amazing. She works for Union Pacific and she has worked for our legislature here in Nebraska. She could be in any state in this country doing amazingly impactful work. And she came back here to do that for a little while. So I, she supports me in ways that she doesn't even know. Um, and I hope I support her in ways that um, make sense to her. And, and help her as well, but I always wanna acknowledge her when she takes the time to come in and see me and, and spend some time. That's Dominique in the back. All right, anybody have any questions? Wow. That, then let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your name, please. Oh, great. My name is Brandon O'Malley, now I'm the department. Um, so I'm getting a little candidate, so I do and born and raised in Omaha and have a cat and be next, you know the one to be next. And you talk about mentoring. Um, who helped support you along the way at every stage? Because uh, being a woman, being a mom, or trying to continue your education and your career, it can be challenging. So who was in your corner cheering you on that know there were days you probably wanted to oh yeah. Um, my whole first semester of law school, I was looking for jobs. I was like, this isn't it. I don't, I don't think I picked, made the right decision. I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm just gonna, I don't know, go teach kindergarten or something like that. Like I'm just not nailing it the way I want to. Um, so I had a lot of people in my corner. Thankfully, I'm incredibly blessed in that way. Um, whether it was like just my grandmothers and my aunts and uncles, um, I have one uncle who um, I completely blame for the nerdy nature in which I'd like dive down into things. He would use the biggest words when I was a kid. And I'd be like, well, what does that mean? And he'd say, go look it up. Now, you know, this is before the internet, right? So it's like Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that, that I had to go find and look these words up and things like that. But lots of support in that way. My mom, um, to be quite upfront, didn't always have the tools in her box to be able to support me in certain ways. So she made sure that she aligned me with organizations uh, in the community like Girls Inc, where I would have women mentors who had been in, in the workplace or been to college or grad school to help me navigate those things because she didn't necessarily have that experience. Um, and so that was encouraging to me. Um, I talk a lot about how representation matters and um, one of my favorite people in the world is Claire Huxtable from, from the Cosby show. Not Felicia Rashad, she's awesome too, but like the actual character um, was very inspirational to me because you just didn't see, you know, black women attorneys. Um, so seeing that on TV, who was married and had kids and some of the things that I had aspirations to do, that was, I, I just, I can't not, like not say that that was, very much uh, formative to me. Um, and then I had one particular grade school teacher, an old German woman um, named Mrs. Gorman, who I lost last year. She passed away at like 80s, I think she was 87. Um, so an incredibly long and fruitful life, but I mean, just like completely poured into me to the point where maybe six months before she passed, we had just had lunch and we still kept track of each other and, and kept in touch all of those years. 
Um, and just a lot of a lot of people, a lot of women, a lot of Black women, a lot of allies in the workplace who have spoken my name in rooms and I didn't even know, you know, who was saying something, but I got recommended for something or someone sponsored me to be the person who was considered for opportunities. So a lot of that, some other Black women attorneys uh, up in juvenile court who said, here, this is how you write a motion. This is, you know, I'll give you a template for this. You don't have to start from scratch. And I try to do that with Dominique and others. Like here, this is what it looks like for me to make a budget for my household. This is, you know, let's go shop for, you have moot court coming up. Let's go shop for a suit and I'll show you how, you know, you should prepare for that. So just hoping that those people don't step in the landmines that I stepped in because I had some great people who, who did that for me. So lots of of mentors and, and folks who sponsored me. Good question. Yes. <laughs> I did not plan her. I did not think she would raise her hand. <laughs> um, Sure. Um, it's a good question, actually. And I think that um, just like you would look for certain qualities in somebody you're going to date or marry, I think you should do that same thing with mentorship. It's that important of a relationship. And so really getting to know that person and making sure that it's a good match that they have the time and capacity to devote to you. Um, and, you know, looking for someone who is in a position where you would like to be and really setting up a concrete relationship where you can get under that person and try to soak up some of what they're doing um, is a huge piece. I think the other thing is um, there always, there hasn't always been a black woman in the position that I wanted to get to, if that makes sense. So it doesn't have to be a black woman for me. Like I can see myself pretty much in, in anyone. You're really trying to get to the content, the skill set. Um, so I would say just being comfortable stepping outside of maybe your identities and learning from someone that is different from you is important because you're not gonna always have that match um, there. And then really being respectful of that person's time if you're the one that's being mentored and being prepared for those meetings. So I love it when people come with questions or things that we can discuss or do. Um, I love it when people, you know, take the time to really help to develop that relationship as well, knowing that mentoring is, is a two-way street. And I learn from my mentee all the time. She keeps me current with things because I'm getting old now. And, um, you know, it's just delightful to be able to learn from someone else as well. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things. Don't, I, I would say, don't be afraid to get to know somebody that you wouldn't otherwise get to know. Be very intentional about diversifying your network. Yes. Uh, I think it's the benefits of, of one of the different mentor structure as opposed to another. Because I know that some people will just schedule up and say, let's meet in two or three hours a week and go over your questions that you have and have to schedule. And that's like all the way to how long it goes. Mm -hmm. But I know that, like, um, kind of how much time you can dedicate to that person, how you spend the sheets and stuff. Yeah. I think it, it varies by the mentoring relationship. And I think that's a conversation that is best had early on so that you can get what you need out of the mentoring relationship. Um, I don't know that there's one specific way to do it because it kind of depends. And it also depends on where that person that you're mentoring is at in their career or their development. Like Dominique moved to uh, Washington DC for a couple of years and worked for the Congressional Black Caucus. So that kind of changes the dynamic of our mentoring relationship. So I, I hesitate to like nail you down to a strict structured, like you need to talk twice a week or you need to, you know, talk every quarter or have lunch or anything like that. I prefer a more organic flow to a mentoring relationship. As things come up, I invite Dominique to things. Um, 
you know, I'm, I have to go meet with the Iowa, Nebraska, NAACP and some legislative people are going to be there. The bar president is going to be there. She's newer to our profession. Are you available to go to this lunch with me? I get a plus one. So why not bring my mentee and start to introduce her to my network so that one, I can start turning some things over to her because mother's tired. And <laughs> for two, so that she can make her own contacts and forge her own way. And people can see how amazing and impressive she is. So I would say a lot of people think, you know, just having questions and meeting for lunch, but what about other ways that you can incorporate your mentee into your life? What, what can you bring him or her along to that will increase that person's network and give them some value? And she can see me doing things like speaking to a group, telling my story. She can see how she could structure those things if she's asked to do that. So I try to just incorporate her in so many different ways. If it's, do you want to watch the Jeffrey Dahmer documentary together or is that stuff we like to do or do you want to go shop or and and some of those conversations just happen while we're out and about or doing things um and then sometimes it's very very intentional like I want you to come to this luncheon because I need to introduce you to these people and I need them to know who you are and I need to be able to be like come meet her she's amazing you know so I, I hesitate to give you like the structure because I feel like it should be more of an organic flow. And the communication has to be there where you can say either I need more of your time or I need more guidance from you, or, you know, I've got this now a little bit and, and I, maybe we don't need to meet as often, but, you know, can I call you if something comes up? So I think the flow and the match makes that evolve organically if, if it can. I hope that's helpful. I, I know it didn't like completely give you a structure, but I just don't believe in that structure like that. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that when you're very small, or you start at some of the ones that you tend to go to today. Do you find that the issues that you talk about were cases change over time in your brief, or do you kind of stay the same? It just evolved. But... Yeah, so kind of like me. So in, when I teach my class, I approach it. Um, so of course, like me, my class is kind of hybrid or dualistic. So I do like the strict law stuff. So they'll learn about the cases that formed, you know, what is now anything that's race related in, in American law. They also learn about like the fundamentals of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. I make sure that that terminology and those concepts are applied in each situation. And then they also learn about the social justice and modern application. So we'll look at something like um, the Loving case, which granted individuals the rights to marry interracially, right? And we'll talk about all of the legal stuff. We'll talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion implications. And then we'll transition our conversation to like more modern day application. So Loving happened in the 50s, right? Um, which I try to also, just as a side note, let them know that because we're watching some of this stuff and it's in black and white, that wasn't that long ago. It was not that long ago that black and white people couldn't marry in this country. Um, and so I don't want them to see it as ancient history because some of those things are still evolving in different places today. So how do we apply that to marriage equality under the law You know, that just happened a few years ago to the LGBT community? How do we apply that to other things? What are the other ancillary issues like housing, people be, being discriminated against for housing because they were in an interracial relationship, um, you know, employment and discrimination, all of those different things. So I try to teach it from an aspect that incorporates everything, but it is challenging. It's an elective course. It's a two hour versus a three hour course. So it's, I have basically one night a week to get a lot of stuff in for a semester. So yeah, that's how I approach it. And my course is different. A lot of times in law school, it's a bunch of professors like quizzing you about all the cases you've read and you have to be on and you have to make sure that you can articulate and hit all the points. That's not my class. My class is reflective. It's mindful. It's them writing reflection papers, doing group work. It's peer teaching. I have them teach each other as well um, because I want to make sure that they know this because 
they're getting ready to be the attorneys in the county attorney's office who's deciding um, sentences for people. Or, um, you know, I've worked in both the public defender's office and the county attorney's office. The vast majority of the clients are people of color. So I want to make sure that they understand their impact through a DEI lens so that they are being eth ethical practitioners in that area. There are people who are in juvenile court. There are people who are just in any type of, mm -hmm. there's no requirement that they're going into juvenile or anything like that to come to my class. So I just want them to go out and have that knowledge as allies um, for my white students who are in my class so that they can be ethical and see things through a DEI lens and understand the importance of that. And for my uh, students of color, I want to affirm for them and have them see a face that kind of looks like them and has a lived experience like them at the front of the room, but also affirm for them some of the things that have caused so much racial trauma in this country. Yes. Uh, Tell me your name. <laughs> That's a good question. Tell me your name, though. Savannah? Okay. Um, so Savannah, um, I have a paper calendar. I also have a digital calendar. I have sticky notes everywhere. I have a vision board. I journal. Um, I'm constantly having to make sure that I have everything. I'm a very organized person though. Um, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Dominique because she's like, she knows what my offices look like and all that stuff. So I'm also a very categorized person. So I try to keep, you know, this is my law stuff. This is my DEI and public speaking stuff. This is my board service and community stuff. Um, church is incredibly important to me as a person of faith and I'm very active in mine. So this is my church lane. So I have all these lanes that I'm trying to navigate. Um, so relying on my calendars is huge. And my paper calendar, I'm still kind of married to my paper calendar, although I'm converting to much more digital, um, but that's a huge piece. If it's not written on that calendar, it doesn't happen. So, yeah, good question. Yes. Absolutely. And I want to know how being involved in the organization and what is your thinking? Oh man. Really good to network and still get to have these benefits, but reach out to really all kinds of I kind of as much about that kind of all of that. So yeah. yes. Um so the thing about predominantly and historically black fraternities and sororities, as well as some of the other uh, multicultural and, and minority ones, are that we're in, in it for a lifetime. So I'm a member of an alumni chapter. I'm active on the local level. I do some regional stuff as well. I attend our national conventions and stuff like that. Um, amazing networking in fraternities and sororities because I can go to any city and I have a ready-made network because those people connect with me in those ways. Or I have sores that I know in other cities who I can say, hey, I'm here this weekend. Anything from where can I get some good crab legs to where can I shop to, hey, I need some connections with people. Can we set up? some meetings at a coffee shop um, and I'll work there for the day. Can you connect me with some folks in Cincinnati because I'm gonna be doing business here and I wanna increase my network. So that kind of thing. Um, so incredible for that. And also for mentoring. And I will say like my organizational skills, a lot of my leadership skills, all of those things, one of the first places that I got a chance to practice those was within the, the sorority chapter, very business oriented. Um, and I was chapter president. so like trying to make sure that when as a, an undergrad in collegiate years, I'm still like keeping things going and spinning. So um, yes, very, very instrumental. Not to mention that we have a lot of high profile members in our sorority, honorary and otherwise, that are very, very inspirational people as well. And like when we go to national convention, they're just like right there, just like us, like right next to us waiting in line to get into opening ceremony and so, you know, you have those fangirl moments, you get your picture and things like that, but like, it's nothing to just see celebrities walking around our convention and their deltas just like us. And they're excited to meet us. Like we're excited to meet them. And so single-handedly, the most beneficial thing that I did as an undergrad was enjoy my sorority. So yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay. Yep. 
how many sectors? Okay, you mentioned the sector for the first law of the city and the model section, which is going to be from the next. Sure. And um, can you pitch your um, review and why the review all title is on it? Can you talk a little bit about what stopped it? And did you still like at this point, the possible, I think a lot of us in the law of the organization have um, struggled because it's actually usually made more than three, four, or five of us. Um, <laughs> but I want to see often though that we do have the power to be, and we still see that. I have other folks who say, oh, you're making me too close to the law. Then that was worth me coming here today if you're going to start thinking about that from now. Excellent question. First of all, if I have nothing else, I have the nerve always. Okay. <laughs> always. Um, so, um, I mean, what's the worst thing that my CEO could have said? No, we can't do that. Okay, well, I'm still in the position that I'm in. I'm still making the coin that I'm making now. Um, I still have a good position, but how can I make that better? And I think oftentimes that's what we don't think about is advocating for ourselves, one. And two, that we're in interviewing our employer when we started a job, just like they're inter interviewing us, excuse me. Um, so like that fit needs to be there and your personal development, your professional development needs to be at the forefront of what you're doing. So I know that a lot of organizations have moved to like optionally every year you can evaluate your performance. Heck yeah, every year evaluate your performance, not optional. This is your time to like pitch to the company or the organization why you're valuable and what you bring to the plate. Um, so in my email, I have a folder that I save as it's usually marked like kudos or brag file or something like that. And so every time I do some type of work and somebody emails me afterwards and says, that was a great presentation that you put together, or I appreciated your help on this or that, I just boop, copy that and put it over there. Because a lot of times when we do our performance review, we're thinking about like maybe the quarter before that. We're not thinking about everything that we've done all year. So I like to go back through and look at that stuff so that I can make sure when I evaluate myself or I talk about what I've been doing, it's comprehensive from the beginning of the year to the end. Um, especially if maybe I had something that didn't go as well, and I don't want that to be fresh on their minds. I want you to have this, you know, all this other, not like the, whatever happened that failed. Luckily, I had a CEO um, who believed that, you know, he wanted us to fail on purpose. So like try things and do things. Um, and then the other thing is just making sure that you're mindful of yourself and your worth. And like I told you before, I do like vision boards and things like that. So I'm always thinking about like, okay, so what do I want to go to next? What, and, and part of that move for me was figuring out, okay, what do I want to transition to? And what do I need to have set up right now in my positions, in my compensation, so that that's marketable for what I want to do later. So I would say don't short yourself. And if you are doing things, because organizations tend to couch everything in that other duties as a sign. When you start to track what you're doing and you see that you're doing in the other duties as a sign, one thing, think about what that should be titled as and how that can be added as far as compensation is concerned. So I think part of it is just like knowing your worth and getting comfortable with advocating for yourself and you know mastering that humble brag so that you can really capitalize on everything because if you're content with not asking for it they're not going to give it to you right especially any of us that work in nonprofits you know the excuse is always well we don't have the budget we don't have the money yes you do yes you do you have the money <laughs> and I want it right <laughs> I have things that I want to do too so you know that's the kind of thing either that or they end up losing you to some of it other company or, or organization that will. So that's a good, um, and I don't mind sharing my contact information as well. So if you have questions afterwards that you didn't get, cause I did see you writing a lot, um, or if you just want to sit down for lunch or, you know, the talk and that goes for anybody in the room, then um, contact me. So um, my email address is my first name, Chantel. It's S-H-A-W-N-T-A-L. And then there's a dot. And then ESQ, 
like Esquire, like attorney. So chantel.esq at gmail.com. I'm also on LinkedIn under my name, Chantel Mallory. So connect with me on there as well. I thank you all so much for your attentiveness and being your questions.